Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Ole Olsen, I'm with the Stockholm Environment Institute, SCI, I'll be moderating this session. Um, this is like a theme session around, sorry, I'm going, uh, a theme session around a project called Oil and Gas Transitions uh, that we've been running um, for a year and a half about. Um, it's, funded by the, it's funded by the KR Foundation and the Laudis Foundation and the focus is basically to, to develop oil and gas transition scenarios for the North Sea countries, Denmark, the UK and, and Norway. Um, and uh, the setup for today's session is basically like we start with uh, my colleague Felipe Sanchez from SCI, who's going to give like a set in the scene about the just transition um, pr prospects in this in this region. Then we'll hear a sort of short presentation, speed talks, if you like, from uh, each of these three countries: from from Carl, from Kirsten, and from Camilla. Uh, after that, we'll have a short Q and A, particularly focusing on North Sea um, con uh, context. Uh, following on that, to sort of avoid us getting stuck in like North Sea navel gazing, we'll have uh, Valerie Marcel from Chatham House who's going to give like a broader context and see how this sort of North Sea transition context relates to the broader um, aspect of, of transitions globally, especially from an emerging oil producer perspective, maybe. Um, and with that, uh, I just want to, I guess, invite Philippe up to give us the scene. I'm Felipe Sanchez. I am a researcher at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and I've been with the oil and gas transitions in the North Sea project since its establishment um, two years ago. I've mainly been focusing on the evidence for policy action amongst the North Sea producers, but also equity issues related to global phase out more broadly. And the title of my opening sort of intervention is what does just transitions mean for oil and gas? Um, and I'll be I'll be setting the scene for this panel discussion by briefly outlining what we know about how transitions work and what we mean by just transitions followed by the role uh, that evidence, research, and inclusive mechanisms can play to accelerate policy action on just transitions, and finally, connecting just transitions to the North Sea uh, region. So just to kick off, I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here, but um, of course, we know that global phase out of oil and gas is undoubtedly a big shift from the status quo. Um, the, what we know from the production gap report is that we're obviously on course to uh, produce more fuels that are needed to remain uh, on course to limit global warming. Uh, and this has been likely worsened by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But the history of socio-technical transitions has taught us um, that unmanaged means bad. And for those of you familiar with uh, the history of, of the UK, uh, in the 80s there was a, um, a huge um, industrial decline and the map on the left uh, particularly shows uh, coal mining regions of the UK and the map on the right shows uh, deprivation. And what we've seen is that this huge unmanaged uh, decline has had consequences to this day in the dark blue regions which are the most deprived um, in England. On the other hand, we know that uh, the history of transitions has also given us examples of where transitions have been managed for good. Um, and we have uh, the picture at the bottom, at the bottom left, uh, shows uh, the web page that you can find when you look up the Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund and how much money that's recouping. And it's, I, I know this is a weird example to use in this case, but I'm using it as an example of a well-managed transition in the sense that it avoided the resource curse. And the reason for its establishment was to avoid uh, the resource curse, what we now call the resource curse of oil. On the right-hand side, you have uh, Denmark's uh, North Sea Agreement from 2020. And this, uh, agreement uh, set the phase out date and cancelled the licensing round for oil and gas exploration, uh, which shows us what the sunset of an oil and gas um, era can look like. And despite, despite these examples being at opposite, opposite ends of the uh, production curve, they both have long term visions uh, as a common denominator. But um, what would make a transition away from oil and gas just? Um, as Isabel and Gaylor highlighted in the plenary earlier today, there is no si single definition that is um, set in stone. There are many conceptions of a just transition, but at their core, most conceptions seek to address the uneven spread of risks and opportunities that are inherent in socio-technical transitions towards post-carbon societies. In other words, they deal with issues of distributive fairness from the, glo from the global low-carbon transition, particularly for people and regions. Um, that now depend on fossil fuel industries. And while there are different frameworks for conceptualizing a just transition, there's the International Labour Organization, OECD, the EBRD that we saw earlier today, our colleagues uh, 
at SEI have developed seven principles based on their analysis of industrial transitions, which we in the project have used as the anchor for our research. Um, so I'm just going to run through them a little bit and give you a flavor. I'll just run through them and give you a little bit of flavor of, of, of what they each mean in practice for oil and gas. So the first two principles, we have actively encourage decarbonization and avoid the creation of uh, locking or carbon locking. And by this, if we link that to oil and gas, we're talking about uh, the setting of phase out dates, investments in clean technology, no new investment in oil and gas infrastructure. The next two principles relate to support, support for affected regions, support for workers, families and communities. And if we think of what these measures look like for oil and gas, we're talking about investments in economic diversification, education, reskilling, reskill, um, urban re regeneration. We also have a cleaning up environmental damage without socializing the cost. So this is, for example, putting the polluter pays principle in regulation, planning and decommissioning. Uh, addressing existing uh, economic and social inequalities. And here as examples, I've put the uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform, energy efficiency measures. And finally, ensure a, an inclusive and transparent planning process. So things like local engagement, um, planning and, consult and consultation. And, and uh, evidence, research and inclusive mechanisms can accelerate the policy action in line with the principles that I just outlined on the previous slide. They do so by providing improved understanding of complexity and uncertainty that a just and transition needs to navigate and address. By uh, bringing together diversity of perspectives and collective learning that comes with having the right stakeholders in the room. They bring aspects of procedural and also restorative fairness for vulnerable communities and marginalized voices. Um, mutual trust among stakeholders uh, that comes from having respect for divergence and, and an appreciation for consensus. And uh, finally, buying and democratic legitimacy for uh, a transition. So how does the, this link to the North Sea? So we can think about the conditions that make the North Sea uh, special. So we think about uh, when we think about the North Sea, we re we know that it's a mature and dwindling offshore resources. It's uh, characterized by capital intensive exploration and extraction, and it has challenging environmental conditions. While at the same time, North Sea producers have the capacity to transition in terms of wealth, uh, social safety nets provided by the state, and access to potential alternative sources of energy. In addition, they have the governance and legal frameworks in place. Trust in, political uh, trust in political institutions and constitutional democracies with traditions of popular political participation. And by bringing these things together um, with the leadership that North Sea producers have played on the global demand reduction, it makes sense that North Sea it makes sense for North Sea regions to play a leading role in, the, in a just transition away from oil and gas. And I'll just finish uh, with the words that I heard from an audience member and a panel discussion we hosted um, last year at COP26, um, which said, if North Sea producers can't set the right example, then who can? I hope this opening intervention has helped to set the scene for my fellow speakers. Thank you, Felipe. And now we're moving into a discussion on the three case countries, uh, starting with uh, Carl from Denmark. Yes, thank you, Ole. Um, are you going to announce the news uh, later on, or can, 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 I, can I say, well, because we've, uh, we've done, no, you, please go on. <laughs> I just forgot to say during our events that we're actually launching the reports from these three countries today, so they're just coming on our website, so please go check them out, so it's a very timely, uh, so we, you're at the official launch, um, <laughs> um, sorry, no, no drinks. No red carpet. Well, the carpet's kind of red, but no drinks. But you know, we'll... I, I just needed that because we only we only got five minutes, so I can say, please read the reports um, if there are any detailed questions. Yes, thank you. Um, we have studied three countries: Denmark, UK, and Norway, and um, this is the result of our second activity, the co-production of um, of scenarios to accelerate the transition away from oil and gas. Um, my name is Karl Sperling. I'm from uh, Aalborg University, um, sitting in the Sustainable Energy Planning Research Group. And we have uh, done the report together with uh, the colleagues that you barely can see listed on the slide there. 
Okay, moving into the quick run through. Um, as Felipe has mentioned, Denmark has set an end date um, for oil and gas uh, phase out 2050. And uh, I would just like to highlight that, um, yes, this was done. Um, one, uh, to become a global leader and to show the global community that this is possible, that an industrialized uh, nation, the fourth largest um, oil and gas producer in the EU, actually can, can opt out. And um, it was also done to sort of link up with the rest of the green transition going on in Denmark, which is about um, moving out of oil and gas consumption, um, where the end date 2050 has been set some 10, 12 years ago already. So um, linking up to the seven principles, um, some of them have been covered quite well, actually, in, in the North Sea Agreement, and some of them we might ask um, ourselves, oh, have they been covered well? So is everything going well in Denmark or, or, or what? Um, that's what we've asked ourselves in activity two. And um, we actually put a question mark behind 2050 and dared to ask, um, is this ambitious enough? Can we really set an example um, being Denmark and saying 2050 as a phase out? This is how oil and gas production has been looking like. And you can see there is a, there's quite a steep decline going on already. So we were wondering um, what would happen if we tried and phase out earlier, let's say 2042 or 2035. Would it be such a big catastrophe for, for the economy of Denmark? Um, could, could we afford it or, or, or would it create too much debate and problems? We looked at it pure, purely in purely economic terms in, in terms of state uh, revenue and loss of state revenue. Um, other issues were discussed in the report, please read it, um, but, uh, but we, we see this as a start. We want to uh, push the discussion. Um, we made a model where we basically had uh, as an input um, production and prices and, uh, 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 and on the other hand the costs of uh, operating and building um, infrastructure and decommissioning it. And, then as an output, um, taxation, uh, state revenue from taxation and ownership of 20% uh, of, the, of the production offshore. Um, so our baseline is the 2050 simulation, which, which we did in a, in a Monte Carlo model. Uh, that's the gray area, which sort of shows all kinds of uh, possibilities and possible outcomes and where we can see the, the Danish ministries and energy agencies uh, own um, projections in the blue curve and the, and the purple curve and our is the black curve which you can see follows quite well the the official projections um, what we can see is in 2042 around 2042 um, there's a serious decline in state income because of uh, decommissioning costs basically so far so good what happens uh, in the other years in uh, 2042 um, we can actually see that most of our biggest licenses, they run out in 2042. So if we also put decommissioning there, the result is that the losses to the state would be insignificant. Um, so it could be, it's, it's fair to say that from an overall socioeconomic point of view, there wouldn't be any big problem in, uh, in phasing out by 2042. If we go one step further and say 2034, um, we would have uh, more significant losses in the order of 5 billion um, uh, US dollars. But if we compare it to the, uh, to the overall state budget, um, we can see that this is at the level of 0.1%. So uh, I, we believe at least with this figure we can start a debate, uh, a realistic debate of, uh, of how fast can we be in Denmark. What are the implications? Um, the oil and gas transition has been surprisingly smooth. Uh, there has not been any uh, large debate or protests against this. Um, the climate minister announced himself that, uh, that the, the losses in 2050 would be in the order of 1.7 billion uh, US dollars, or as you can see, a very low share of the annual public expenditure. Um, and, and another factor supporting is that we have one main oil and gas producing area that's around Esbjerg and, and the harbor there. But on the overall uh, level, uh, employment in, in oil and gas is fairly small uh, in Denmark. Um, one thing we were surprised about and discovered is that the, the workforce is rather versatile. So they keep moving between oil and gas and offshore renewables all the time. 
right now we are in a recession in offshore uh, renewables, so they're moving back into oil and gas. And that's uh, that's a particular Danish thing, I would say, that's, that people working in offshore are being educated to be able to work in both sectors. Um, yeah, simultaneously, through, during not this year, but during the last years, uh, renewables have been booming. So, um, so there has been sort of this welfare net for for the for the for the workforce. Um, and Esbjerg itself has been going through these changes a couple of times. They went from fishing to oil and gas, and now to offshore renewables. So, there's no cultural, not a strong cultural identity with oil and gas there. Um, Yes, even political support, you might say. What would we recommend based on this um, for, for other oil and gas producing countries? And um, it's difficult. Uh, I can see that it's, it's not easy. But one thing that we, th that we think worked pretty well was that uh, in 2019, um, the minister uh, gathered uh, um, not only the green technology industry, but also the oil and gas industry. And they created what they called 13 climate partnerships, uh, where, they, where he gave them a task and said, we want to reduce um, CO2 emissions by 70% in 2030. How can we do it? That's your task. So please come up with solutions and uh, make some ple pledges on how many megatons of CO2 you would like to reduce. And that seemed to have had a, an effect because um, the oil and gas producers were actually quite happy to be included in that discussion. Um, right, so based on this, um, the ministry also felt confident to actually announce an end date. Um, so setting this end date is, uh, is, is probably the one clear and most significant signal that, that, that you can have um, towards the phase out. Um, but of course, an end date should also be set so that there's enough time for adjustment. Um, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't feel too overwhelming. Um, 2050 certainly is not overwhelming at all for Denmark, in, in our opinion. Um, while you do it, there should also be a discussion of how to compensate losers. And uh, that has certainly been started in the North Sea Agreement. Um, there's been uh, funding going into CCS and energy islands and renewable energy development offshore based on the infrastructure that is already in place in places like Esbjerg. Um, so, so there has been uh, funding going into harbor expansions and things like that for, for power to X and shipping uh, offshore uh, wind turbines in the same agreement. And this is my last point. All, um, <laughs> education and re-education uh, has, been, has been key and uh, is something that uh, is being quite heavily debated, especially in the oil and gas producing region around, around Esbjerg. Um, um, there's actually um, seems to be a lack of skilled workforce for renewables at the moment. Um, so, so, so we are prep, we actually might run into the opposite problem that we, we don't have the problem that we cannot re-employ oil and gas workers. We have too few um, of those skilled oil and gas workers um, that, that could carry, carry on the renewable energy development. With this um, graphic recording from our co-production workshop, I would like to end and, and say thank you. Uh, my name is Camilla, I'm a researcher at FAFO, the uh, an, uh, uh, social and labour research centre in Oslo. Uh, and I've been co-writing this report with a number of, uh, of uh, colleagues from the University of Oslo and multi-consult. One person is actually a former MP from the Energy I mean, so, so co-production even on that level. Uh, <clears throat> I'll come back to the title where we provocatively ask if accepting a net zero pathway is a way of avoiding a phase out scenario. Uh, the Norwegian oil and gas situation is very different from the Danish and it comes also from a history of a very successful transition to oil, which is also important to the cultural idea of, of um, where we come from. Uh, so, so in a way the, the how we managed oil in Norway, it has been a social and economic success, which also means that it's extremely significant today and therefore also challenging to move away from. 
So as you see, there's 28% of the GDP, 20% of our state budget, uh, 200,000 workers are related to, this is, depends a little bit on what statistics you use, but it's up to 6% of the workforce. So it's very significant. Um, but it's also um, providing 27% of our, our emissions are from production. And this is specifically oil production. It's not consumption because the main consumption is from hydropower and um, and transport is separate. Uh, there is already a projection that uh, oil and gas will be in decline. However, that is not very strongly reflected in the public discourse. Uh, we have uh, relatively ambitious emission targets. Uh, also, as Norway wants to be kind of a climate leader in the global setting, this is uh, not necessarily followed with very concrete and operationalized uh, policies, but things are happening and moving very quickly here. The general phase-out plan, there's no phase-out plan. The, the narrative that has settled with the current government is that we will develop, not wind up. So the end date discussion is is avoided by all politicians because it creates polarization and a lot of resistance. However, this develop not wind up is a bit unclear. And the general idea is also there's a lot of reference to because we are the greenest, most social and most democratic production and given the current situation with the energy crisis in Europe after Ukraine, we should basically continue. However, we did this uh, back podcasting exercise. We gathered stakeholders from policymakers, from civil society, that is unions and environmentalists, and from the industry. Uh, and we had a two-day seminar where we first discussed uh, or asked these stakeholders to discuss concrete uh, milestones and, and uh, to, to get to a net zero or face out. Uh, also discussing which actors had different responsibilities and what kind of barriers and opportunities came along the way uh, in order to achieve a just transition to these two uh, hypothetical visions. And for us, it was extremely important to emphasize the hypothetical because the stakeholders do not embrace the visions necessarily. Uh, we also had a, a, an artist who followed the process, and this is her, her takeaway from the two discussion. And as you see, the net zero vision is relatively optimistic. People are, are going in the same direction. Uh, there may be some hurdles, but we're getting there. Face out, not so easy. So concretely, when we discuss the phase out, we ask the stakeholders to relate to this, um, this visual where you see here, the, it's based on the statistics of Norway projection of oil production, uh, <clears throat> where you see the, the blue line is the difference between the projection and an actual phase out. And the stakeholders, rather than saying how to get there, they were more concerned about the effects of that. First, it's important that all of them agreed, if we are getting there, we need an immediate political intervention, uh, i.e. a ban on, on any production by 2050. And most of the discussion beyond that was on all the problems economically and socially that would emerge from such a ban. Uh, and you see the, the stapled line where they say they, they would fear that there would be an increase in short-term production to compensate for the loss of the long-term potential here. Uh, and that will also have social consequences because of the security and the tempo. Uh, and it will also bind up resources, both in terms of capital and human resources in oil and, and therefore also hinder uh, the development of a green transition. I'm rushing a little bit here. However, when we came to the net zero pathway, there was an agreement and a perceived kind of embracement of the, the, 
uh, vision itself. And we've seen also even the oil fund last week said that they will uh, adhere to the net zero by 2050. So, so the idea to get there is relatively uh, uh, coherent in the Norwegian politics. Um, and there's two, two defined kind of responses that needs to be. Uh, and this is the, the, the timeline used this time is based on the uh, IEA's projection of, uh, of net zero pathways. Um, and when it comes to the offshore wind, that means that the, the production to compensate for the production emissions in oil and gas, we need to electrify the installations offshore. And the idea is to roll out offshore wind quickly. The challenge here will be onshore electricity and energy crisis, as we see now, that this kind of rolling out windmills offshore um, can also disturb the, the electricity market. Offshore CCS needed. <laughs> Uh, quick to the, <laughs> um, I've tried to distinguish between what comes directly from the stakeholders and the blue is more from the research team. Uh, there's a very strong sense that this kind of exercises are useful and it needs to be very specific in to set a target and to identify milestones along the way. And that has uh, potential to be used in in uh, in policy settings however some of the politicians are like we're in a four-year cycle so that's also impossible uh, what we add is that there's a general need for a transformation narrative as there's a lot of popular resistance especially on on the rollout of green uh, uh, energy like battery and um, and windmills and there's a need for coherency and very clear and unambiguous targets in this. So basically a need for operationalizing the, the, the goals. Uh, there's also a critical point at 2030 now with the decline of oil, which will also mean a decline in employment. Uh, and it's insufficiently kind of used in the public. Um, there's also this expectation of popular resistance that the, they acknowledge. Um, the stakeholders emphasize the need to use the tripartite institutions that are already very strong in Norway, which means the, the labor organizations. Um, and that is what has happened. There's a, a labor defined just transition commission. And what we have discussed as a research team is the danger that that is rigged to deal with social and economic issues, but not ecological issues. And the unions and the business are resisting having environmental actors on board. So we are kind of gently saying that maybe we should open up or, or at least we need more and more inclusive processes beyond that specific. Yeah. My name is Carson Jenkins. I work at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and I think it's fair to say that our presentation or our report is a bit of a Scotland-UK fusion. I'm also the person responsible for suggesting that we talk for five minutes each, so sorry for <laughs> uh, the rush. And what I will say to you is I don't think uh, this is going to be the most uplifting presentation you've ever seen in your life. Um, so following a similar but slightly adapted format, um, we also worked with a, a multi-stakeholder group um, to explore two scenarios, which I'll explain. <clears throat> but just to say, as a little bit of UK background, I think the primary thing uh, to see at the moment um, are these quotes on the left-hand side that Overall, uh, we don't see that there's a fiscal or regulatory regime in the UK that's favoured, uh, sorry, the overall fiscal and regulatory regime in the UK is favoured towards further investment and exploration in the North Sea. Um, <clears throat> so certainly a very difficult time to be asking these questions about doing the exact opposite. And we're also very clearly saying that the UK government has neither a just transitions policy nor a governmental body committed to achieving its goals. So this is language that is uh, pushing against an established 
um, <clears throat> want to not hear anything about the just transition to some extent, um, despite language popping up within the UK context, particularly through the Welsh government and the Scottish government. Despite that, there are, of course, ambitions to be net zero. Um, there's a complex network of um, production and import <laughs> and export. Um, and there are some positives, you might argue, around emissions declining um, <clears throat> and being decoupled from economic growth. But still, I'm sorry, I'm going to try and make it uplifting. I can't. Not on this slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but still, some, some real policy contradictions. So we're starting with a baseline where we have policy around uh, maximizing economic recovery sitting alongside ambitions for net zero and trying to work out how, how those might reconcile and having some fairly controversial policy measures around the North Sea tra or North Seal as it says North Seal transition deal um, that's just to uplift the mood I think um, <clears throat> which you know has been widely criticized in the way in which it was created and, and enacted so again, a really pertinent time to be asking these um, questions, but one in which we faced um, a series of challenges engaging with our stakeholders. <clears throat> so a bit like Norway, we came up with um, two potential scenarios. Um, and these scenarios were, in the same way, extremely hypothetical. They were there as straw men, as discussion points to provoke, um, but certainly not there to <clears throat> presuppose that any one of these futures was more desirable um, or to lead people um, into any particular policy pathway. They were simply there to start our discussions. So on day one, uh, we discussed what we have rather <laughs> badly named uh, the median anticipated pathway. We're trying to came up with something catchy, but three academics in a room really doesn't <laughs> lend itself to that. Um, <laughs> so the median anticipated pathway, um, broadly speaking, looked at achieving net zero through a managed decline, um, really emphasised the need to retrain, um, this, to retain some of the skills and expertise and knowledge that we have, and to look, as we often forget in these discussions, also at demand size phase out um, <clears throat> as part of this transition. And we saw this as having some positives as the energy mix diversifies um, and skilled labour stays with us, but changes um, the application of what they know and what they do. More provocatively, um, on the second day, we moved towards what is actually well named as a rapid exit, um, where we refer to the closure of oil and gas activities by 2050 in short order, um, the end of domestic production and reliance on imports, therefore, and a variety of other things that aren't mentioned on the slide, but effectively saying that this is going to happen quickly and the implications, therefore, would be substantial, including around, um, say, 200,000 odd jobs that would very, very quickly be thrown up into the air. It is fair to say, out of all of our discussions, um, that we covered many, many topics. They were really broad, really inspiring, and actually really challenging. But what we did find is that there was next to no consensus um, around the most desirable futures, the most desirable pathways, um, or the concrete courses of action. <clears throat> and so as a team, we had to sit back and think, when you're trying to do these exercises, is consensus still profitable? Or a lack of consensus still profitable? Um, <clears throat> and in reflection, on reflection, we decided it absolutely was. <clears throat> We also had a graphic illustrator, um, rather than Norway having a cheerful skip towards a future. Um, I think this just, you know, nicely describes how complex some of these discussions were. Um, that there were many, many different bits coming up, that some of them were um, <clears throat> pretty pointed in terms of, you know, bottom left, what's missing, the political will. Um, and I suggest we have a commentary on that in the Q&A. <clears throat> but... We still tried, as I said, to bring some, some sense out of this and to work collaboratively to see what was there um, and what could be more profitable. These points, much like Norway, stem both from the research participants, but aren't labelled to a particular organisation or sector or individual, and from the research team. <clears throat> so we see that there's a need um, for collaborative inter intergovernmental relationships between Westminster and the devolved administrations, um, waving a subtle flag for Scotland there, um, that we need to strengthen the governance of transition processes, we need to quantify and publish the estimated implications of continued oil and gas exploration, appraisal and production, particularly over the last couple of weeks of political change, I would suggest. 
and that we do see profitability in some of the measures that have been suggested but not yet put in place, including those around a compliant a climate compatibility checkpoint test, um, again, something that might come into bear more um, given everything that's happening in UK politics at the moment. One of my colleagues is a professor for carbon capture and storage at the University of Edinburgh, so this is his um, point. Um, I'm sure he's got investments that he's trying to bolster here, um, <laughs> but including making a firm uh, decision around the rapid consent construction and operation of carbon capture and storage, um, including a carbon take back application. We also um, see a situation in which the nature of the labour force um, in the UK is highly complex and the nature of the transition that they would make in terms of skills is also highly complex. There are a number of certifications that they have to put in place which although they might include for example working on an oil and gas platform and working on a, a wind turbine platform nonetheless mean that they have to pay more and do something subtly different even though they're fundamentally the same. So we want a standard standardised labour force qualifications, um, which follows a number of other stakeholders' interests in that area. To actively coordinate and foster participatory processes, I'm sure we can talk about that as well. Support readiness to deploy low carbon technologies and supply chain diversification, because being honest, we don't see what the next step is in terms of technological readiness. <clears throat> Think about mechanisms such as Scotland's National Transition Training Fund, and so on and so forth. And just to look at those two points, uh, 11 and 12, to really use the language of the just transition here to clarify its stated aims and audiences and to think about what those principles might look like at a UK level and in harmony with UK devolved administrations that are already using it, albeit in subtly different ways. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, now, so we'll, what we'll do now is we'll have a short Q&A about specifically the, the these presentations, um, and then we'll let uh, Valerie give a talk. So, are you any questions about the situation here? Yep. Yeah. The gentleman up there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much for the uh, presentations. Uh, I've got three points on the UK one. That's okay. Um, is there a necessity to maybe separate oil and gas because UK, about 80% of oil is exported, um, whereas about 40 to 50% of gas is used domestically. Um, so the kind of discussions about energy security and national security seem to be, in the terms of oil, about kind of company security. Um, and it feels like gas might be a bit of a different conversation. So I wonder whether that's something to consider. Another point is whether public ownership is a uh, something to consider for just transitions as well. Although in the case of Norway, it's obviously public ownership isn't necessarily going to translate into a fast just transition, but I wonder in the UK context whether that's something to consider. And also the renewable infrastructures, a lot of the renewable infrastructures being tied into offshore oil and gas for platform electrification. And so I was just wondering about, is there discussions about separating those as well? Um, on the first one, oil and gas separation, um, to be quite honest, that, well, there's a number of different answers. First, it's a project on oil and gas, <laughs> and that's that's united across all of us. So, you know, from a, a research perspective, we were looking both at those two things in tandem. Whether they were ever considered as potentially being separate in any of our research findings or discussions that we had with stakeholders, no. Um, <clears throat> they seem to be very much tied up, albeit with different export um, natures, albeit tied up in a system of production and operation, as far as we can see, that people struggle to disaggregate. Whether Ukraine changes that, um, because we see these you know, gas supply dynamics in particular, is a separate question. And whether things like demand side phase out, um, <clears throat> including of off-grid oil fired homes, changes that discussion is something to be seen. So you're right that it's maybe a profitable avenue to explore. Public ownership did come up um, in our discussions, particularly around that rapid exit. 
Um, but as I mentioned, there was zero consensus on that. I think it's one of those things that keep on, you know, subtly emerging in UK politics, but doesn't have enough power behind it to become a realistic option yet. Um, and also an interesting context in which we would look back at previous transition transitions historically in the UK and say, what are what were the failures of public ownership then? Because it's not necessarily a silver bullet, which means that things are are done better. And then renewable infrastructure, you're right that, you know, there is again a muddy line between what is a fossil based system and what is a, a renewables one to some extent. Um, <clears throat> we've I know last week the team went to the National Decommissioning Centre um, based in Aberdeen where they're doing some of that research looking at um, how these platforms might be reused or how new renewable technologies can be integrated. Um, <clears throat> that might be part of a more median pathway um, where those two things sit side by side but eventually grow apart, if you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not, very personal reflection, but I'm not against the, the possibility that the ref you know, renewable integration into the oil and gas sector helps us get to the overall objective, which is that there isn't one long term. Uh, let's see. There was, uh, yeah, okay. uh, hi, thank you for the presentations. I have a question for uh, Camilla or, or Kirsten. Um, so in the, in the context of the UK, of course, you have oil companies that aren't publicly held or, or they're not state-owned corporations, of course, that are active on the UK continental shelf or in the UK context. Um, it's mostly private companies, Shell, PP, but also um, uh, private equity-backed ones. But of course, in the context of, of, uh, of Norway, we have Equinor. So I'm just wondering, how does that change the picture of, of the political economy of, 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 of phasing out oil and gas? In, in these two different, I guess, political economy contexts. <laughs> Camilla, you want to take this? I, I, can, I can start. I think the, the whole question of state ownership is, is interesting and should probably be seen in a historical context because we have very strong state ownership in hydropower and that was also the model for building state ownership in oil. But this was in the 70s when state ownership and nationalism was cool. <laughs> it's not anymore. So even though we have two thirds of state ownership in Equinor, the idea is to have a, an arm length distance. So, and, and I think it's interesting that I can't remember that the stakeholders discussed how to use Equinor as kind of a vehicle in a transition, because this idea of kind of keeping an arm's length and let them run their own business as business and getting into the nitty gritty details, Equinor is extremely powerful also. And some would say that who, who runs the show, is it the Equinor or, or the politicians? So uh, I think the quick answer is that it does not necessarily change the political economy that it's state owned. The discussion is more in the public on the state needing to intervene and invest directly in green energy. Uh, start oil is moving towards, but as you see, I mean, our projection is that oil is going down. They need to, to come into another section in windmill and they have windmill projects in the UK. Uh, so I, I think that's business. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the the other question is that we are seeing a reproduction. It's the same actors that was in oil that also drive most of the kind of green, especially the offshore green activities. So does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a final question for the North Sea context? Can I add to that one? <clears throat> Sorry? Can I quickly okay, add to quickly, that Okay, quickly, yeah. Yeah, just to say, I think it's a really interesting question, which... <clears throat> I'm the person that goes to academic conferences and opens things up and makes them hard and then you have something to think about over lunch. But effectively, it's it's one of boundary setting around a just transition, to me. Um, we can see in the UK that although it's largely private ownership and there are companies that say British Petroleum or whatever they want to call themselves, they are actually referring to a global network of oil and gas skills and a global network of oil and gas dependencies and trade. So 
whilst we say state, as in we have a vested interest in protecting our own people and our own borders and our own interests, the reality is that it's a much bigger and messier picture, which really challenges why we're working across country contexts. That also has implications for, therefore, the responsibilities, not only within our own boundaries, but beyond them, including the context in which we are going to increasingly import or offshore our emissions. So, <clears throat> provocative. All right, so I think we'll have to move now to, to let Valerie give her intervention, and if you have questions, you can save them for the, for the final Q&A as well. Thanks. Welcome. a bit of can you hear me should i get closer it's okay my role is a bit as a i suppose a discussant kind of looking uh, outside in to to transitions um in uh, industrial con industrialized countries um i think just transitions in low-income countries and uh the developing world are very different it's not central government or regional governments that are engaging with that effective affected communities, uh, identifying sectors that need reskilling. It's um, support that's not from the inside, it's support from the outside, from a rich country uh, that comes to support the transition of a whole economy. Uh, so it's a completely different kind of approach to, to the problem and it, it carries a lot of um, complications in terms of how the support is perceived. Um, and I think it's different with higher income producers, um, you know, uh, that would be from the GCC, for example. Those are not the ones I'm thinking of that can drive their own diversification uh, program. Um, and whether it's successful or not is another issue, uh, much like in the, in the North Sea. Okay, sorry, the GCC are the Gulf producers? Yes, yeah, sorry, Gulf producers. Uh, uh, the, um, yes, thank you. Um, so I think the, the feeling is, uh, so I'm going to make some generalizations in contrast to the great case studies that we've just had, because I'm talking about the whole rest of the world. Um, but though my research is more focused on Africa and the Middle East, um, I think the feeling is that the, these countries are not getting that support for just transitions, or the support that they're offered is not the one that they want. Um, that it's guided by different agendas and it's not addressing the priorities that would guide their identification of a transition path. Um, I think the, it's interesting to maybe highlight the exception of the South Africa Just Energy Transition Partnership because I think that is like the holy grail of a lot of the countries that I work with would, would want to see some real money on the table to, to do something differently over a long process of, of guiding them. So I think this, these, these issues lead to some frustrations about climate inequity, uh, perceptions of being left behind if you don't get that support. Um, and I think perhaps it's not, it's not really a participatory process in the sense that there, there's not a joint, you know, definition of, of what the process would be. Um, and that leads a lot of countries, I think, uh, low-income countries to fall back on what they know, which is oil and gas, um, um, what's, what path they do have. Um, just to maybe say a few things on what the domestic process might look like. Um, and I think what I see in, in many countries that I work with is that there aren't shifting attitudes towards an alternative plan. Um, there, there may be popular concerns for staying, doubling down on oil and gas, uh, popular concerns for climate impacts. Um, like an interesting example um, is Algeria, where uh, in 2017, I think it had laid out a transition plan to 2030 that included a real boost of solar power uh, that was mostly driven to free up more gas for export because the, the domestic users were, were, were using too much very subsidized gas. Um, then the Iraq revolution led to a, a leadership vacuum, and without leadership you can't drive that kind of transition plan. And then the Ukraine crisis led everybody from Europe to line up outside the Minister of Energy's office to you know, express their interest in, in doubling down on gas investments and oil investments. So the, the process is a bit, is somewhat derailed, but not completely. Um, and 
I think it's not derailed completely because there's a popular expectation that they should be transitioning, that they should have a plan, and that they do really live like we all do in, in Europe with the climate impacts uh, that, um, th that are just at an individual level. But with all that, I, I mean, I'm generalizing again, but, uh, but I think what's missing is reform coalitions. Um, there are vested interests in the rent that oil and gas produce uh, and what you can buy with that rent politically. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we were just asking about national oil companies. I think are, are national oil companies in these countries agents of change? or are they putting sticks in the wheels of change? And I think that's actually a really critical issue for, for finding, um, having an ability to adapt uh, and to think of, of, a, of a, um, to have those vested interests in that reform coalition uh, change. Um, just quickly to maybe note a difference between established legacy producers and new producers. Um, I spoke a bit to this yesterday, but the emerging producers have, are very in, very different in this in this discussion. Um, they don't have entrenched dependence. They don't have fiscal dependence on the petroleum sector. Um, they are diversified. So you wouldn't be talking about a decarbonization plan. Um, because they have almost no emissions. It's about, for them, their agenda, to go back to my first point, would be about how to um, get economic growth that brings value today, but builds resilience for tomorrow when the, when the world is uh, decarbonized. Um, and they have equity concerns because um, I think the the you know what we were hearing yesterday from from Fergus about you know the n new norm about establishing a new norm about no new oil and gas obviously targets them very directly, um, and so they see a withdrawal of technical assistance and public funding for the pathway that they want to take, um, and the problem is that it isn't accompanied with a sort of a provision for an alternative or a pathway that can get them gradually from where they are today and where they need to be tomorrow. Um, and so I think that uh, uh, has some echoes with what the, we heard from the other cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie. I just want to take the uh, opportunity to ask a quick question to you. Do, you. do you think that these sort of lessons that we heard today, is that all at all relevant to the sort of the South situation, or is it just, uh, you know, uh, on a completely different uh, context? Well, I think it is completely different, but I think there are... So it is completely different for the way the conversation uh, is taking shape, but I think there will be a lot of lessons to draw on specific things like how how to handle decommissioning, which I think is something we're not focusing on enough, mm -hmm. um, and then repurposing, because there was a question in, in the previous uh, panel on uh, how feasible commercially, uh, technically, is it to convert gas infrastructure to hydrogen? Well, we'll know those answers when those, when those low-income countries want to repurpose, uh, or, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot more, more more answers, I think, but um, I, I think perhaps the m my my caution would just be of of transposing uh, a process that was developed in one country or in a in a set of industrialized countries, obviously to a low income setting would be um, there's a lot of modifications to make along the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, so Steve Pai from UCL. Um, maybe first question to Carl. Um, you showed a very interesting slide that showed how smooth the, the sort of um, move away from oil and gas or the proposed move away from oil and gas had been. Are some of the same industry players um, operating in the Denmark context that are in other country jurisdictions who are providing more resistance <laughs> in other areas, so it would be great if you could reflect on that. Um, and then just a broader question across the countries, um, was there any discussion in terms of just transitions around scope three emissions, production gap report, and 
did that influence the discussions in any way as to how stakeholders responded? Thank you. Right, Carl. Yeah, should we respond? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, thank you, Steve. Um, so I was just, I had a comment to the question of public ownership, which ties into your question. Um, it, it was curious, it wasn't stated directly in any of our contexts to the stakeholders, but um, what happened in 2017, 2018 is that um, the state, uh, majority state-owned company, Ørsted, sold their licenses to um, Total Energies and the other big oil and gas producer, Maersk, uh, I think the year after, sold their licenses to Ineos. A UK um, uh, producer, or it was the other way around. I don't remember. But um, and and the inter interesting about this is that as Denmark went from majority public ownership to majority private ownership, this seemed to have opened the way for the North Sea Agreement. So this is the complete opposite of what we've just talked about before. That uh, you know public ownership might spur uh, the transition, and Denmark was the other way around because and again. Uh, stakeholders were very reluctant to, to talk about this, but I think it is just an economic issue um, because it accelerates the decline in state income. Um, then to your to question about this, the, the industry players, well, Total is, is, is in the middle of it and they receive um, hundreds of millions in funding for developing um, power tracks and uh, offshore energy islands and electrification and CCUS. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure how they behave in other countries, but they haven't behaved um, very, very politely in Denmark always. But, uh, but I, I mean, the rhetoric is in place, <laughs> for, for Total at least. Um, apart from that, uh, there's a big um, uh, discourse on electrification of offshore. And I think that was used to sort of bait the uh, oil and gas producers and say, well, you can get electrified with offshore wind and this can make your production cleaner. So it was kind of a, a trade going on there. Yeah. Um, let's see, Frederick. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, okay, short reply related to the scope three the question. Scope three was explicitly part of the the net zero vision, so the actors were asked to to make a plan accordingly. I don't know if it would be bulletproof, but yes. So, and I also have another comment about Reef mm -hmm. later. But in the UK, no, it didn't come up. Um, we didn't get to that level of granularity. I think <clears throat> drifted off into big meta issues, but not <laughs> not that one. <laughs> Well, yeah, in, uh, in Denmark it was, well, in, in, in terms of the North Sea Agreement, um, a ministerial committee actually looked into this and their conclusion was inconclusive, which was good enough for the minister <laughs> to go ahead. All right, now, Felix, finally. Hi, uh, Frederick Bauer, Lund University. So just... Um, Connecting back to something that was talked about in the plenary this morning about sort of who's uh, in the room and thinking about the value chain, right? So both sort of suppliers and suppliers of the suppliers that are affected uh, upstream, but also downstream. And there we're seeing sort of uh, massive interests. You mentioned Ineos, right? So chemical company buying up enormous parts of the North Sea infrastructure in both Denmark and the UK. Um, so did you in, in your, uh, I mean, how did you talk about the sort of changes of the value chain? Who is to be part of any conversation about the the transition? Sort of how that affects um, actors in the value chain, both upstream and downstream. You know, should they be included? Should they be supported, compensated, or uh, was it all very focused on you know those that are the oil and gas firms today? Is that for everyone? Mm -hmm. You, <laughs> you go ahead, Kirst. Oh, I just volunteered myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> should have stayed quiet. Um, it did come up, um, but it comes up in a number of different ways. I think in the way that you've just articulated, as in upstream and downstream value chains, um, but also in terms of secondary and tertiary 
not oil and gas companies. And I mean that by saying that obviously these systems of production and um, <clears throat> oil and gas are happening in particular geographical contexts. So if we look at the UK, you've got Aberdeen, you've got Shetland, you've got the north of um, England, <clears throat> and we were seeing discussions therefore not only about value chains that went internationally across energy infrastructure, but also hoteliers, um, restaurant owners, people in nail bars actually came up um, because people don't have as much money to spend on the luxuries if you know they're going through series of boom and busts. And so it refers to a much wider conceptualization of um, a just transition as being place-based and also systems-based. I think we also have an imaginary that we've tried to tackle really um, head on that when we talk about oil and gas workers, it tends to be the person in can you, a rubber suit on, a, on an oil turbine or someone working in a lab on an oil um, refinery platform. <clears throat> but actually we were seeing that, you know, helicopter pilots, are certainly part of this. You've got the medics working in um, different rigs and hopping about the North Sea. And so there's a value chain very infrastructurally, but also in terms of human capital um, that has to be accounted for. And when we're thinking about who the workers are, we need a, a very diverse lens on that. To make that more tangible, um, sitting alongside all the work that we're doing, um, there's a special issue um, on oil and gas in the Climate Policy Journal, which looks at some of these value chain issues. Um, and which Valerie is contributing to. So I, I welcome you looking at that. Uh, Camilla. Uh, in the exercise, we explicitly invited throughout the value chain in, in business and, and kind of the talking point is also for the supply industry to create a value chain in CCS and windmills, et cetera, and to be part of that. So, so it's an explicit target. And in the Norwegian discussion in general, it's the supply that is the hub of employment and that are more vulnerable short term. And they say they need someone to ask for and demand green issues. And that's where also they want the state to, to invest. So it was very much there. But my last point that I didn't say was the, the frustration of the stakeholders of setting this as a national debate within Norway, that it, it doesn't make sense because it's a market that kind of goes up. From a Norwegian perspective, that generally means that we have gas and you want it, so we should continue. But it also doesn't relate to stakeholders. And I, I missed that a little bit in your intervention, because I, I think what is interesting here is to identify and, and different stakeholders and have a conversation with them. But that can also go across countries and meeting with these. It's, it's like for me, I'm a labor researcher having workers talking across, but also identifying that these value chains are going across countries, not only in the North Sea, but down to the global south. And a lot of the key stakeholders in Norway have investment and operations in Nigeria, in Brazil, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that there's kind of a need for that conversation and also linking stakeholders across countries and also breaking down the kind of national state talk, but seeing how, and, and there are attempts in labor to do that, and the, the, the global uh, companies do that all the time, not necessarily publicly. So, yeah, just. I remember seeing in the map yesterday was a presentation about Guyana, and Equinor was prominently featured in, in, yeah. in that. Uh, Carl. Yeah, I think it's it's a very good question. I, I I mean, the closest to including the whole value chain that that happened in Denmark was through the climate partnerships actually in 2019. So that was like a, but that was the complete energy producing, using, converting industry that was uh, collected in these 13. Um, I would just like to mention um, one example that that I think was is quite interesting. It's it's a smaller supplier from uh, Esbjerg, Semco Maritime, and they sort of illustrate this versatility quite well because they are both in oil and gas and in offshore wind. Um, so what happens is that uh, they progressively move more towards offshore wind, but they also have this sort of welfare model uh, where they say, well, retiring oil and gas workers can sit at the office and, you know, work a little bit on offshore wind we, we don't fire them because just 
keep them in, in the company. So, so there's this sort of integrated um, model, which is interesting because they are local. Um, and I think you wouldn't see the same with a, with a maybe more global uh, supply company. Um, and what they did note, though, is that um, the effect on small workshops, uh, smaller welder, welders um, below 10 employees and so on, that, that, would, that would be more pronounced because they don't have the same flexibility. Um, but the extent of it uh, is, is still unknown, actually, so we'll, we'll have to see. Um, so uh, I have uh, one question for Camilla uh, on the Norwegian. Uh, I'm Guri Bang, by the way, from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, so it's uh, related to what you were talking about, the workforce, and uh, you mentioned specifically this strong role in Norway for tripartite negotiations. And so I was wondering whether you could sort of reflect on this uh, emerging rift that we see within the labor movement in Norway with uh, the labor organization LO uh, in sort of a, a state where there are uh, conflicting coalitions uh, on this topic of supply side um, climate policies and whether that's the case also in perhaps in Denmark I don't know it's not so much in UK I, I would guess but uh, yeah thank you thank you for a very big question <laughs> Um, yeah, that's kind of background. The, the oil workers unions in Norway are very powerful, but they're a minority within the workforce. So even though they're, but within the union movement or the ELO, which is the kind of the biggest confederation, uh, there has been a history of having issue ownership. So an ELO is a very political union and they have political decisions in their congresses um, so on industrial politics industrial unions have had the final say however on climate change public unions and and trades union come in and have different perspectives and and also claim ownership to climate change in a way that challenges this idea of issue ownership uh, so I think th this has peaked the last 10 years in the, the three Congresses. 2017 was particularly difficult where the industries even su said they would leave if public unions stood on uh, their decision to protect the area around Lofoten. Uh, but it ended up in, in, a, in, a, in a compromise. I think there has been internal discussions between industries and, and public sector unions. The public sector unions have toned down their, their climate engagement, is my impression. Uh, whereas the industry unions and specifically the ones that uh, David and I have been talking to, in 2017 they were seeing red literally when anyone said an end date to to oil and and said they didn't want to explore more when you talk to them now they describe that they are in a green transition so so it's more of a current reality than an abstract future uh so so no, now it's more a discussion on how that transition will go than to avoid it so i think there's a change in the in on both sides of the but it's there and it's it's uh, it's a challenge. And I think the the power of the union is still on the industry side. And yeah, I think that's the very old. Uh, let's see a final question here, maybe. Thanks. Hi, um, Felix from ETH Zurich. I have a question relating to your presentation, Carl. Uh, you were talking about how there's a large transferability and also transfer between workers in the oil and gas sector and other sectors, be it renewables or fishing. And it seemed that in the context of the other two case studies, Norway and, and the UK and Scotland, that that was not the case. And there's this large question, right, of, of how transferable are these skill sets, be it from coal to solar or from offshore oil and gas to offshore wind. And I'm wondering what, what do you guys think are the factors shaping, uh, well, either inhibiting this transfer or uh, promoting this transfer of those skill sets 
be it institutional or or others. Yeah. Thanks. I can start. Um, so we talked to the labor union that um, that is sort of the umbrella for. Um, I think the best translation would be maritime engineers. And um, that's, um, I found out afterwards, that seems to be a very specifically Danish education. It's, it's, um, it's sort of a, a applied college application. Um, so it's quite specialized, but, uh, but also, also rather academic. Um, and uh, in, that, in that, that education simply makes sure that, um, that, that the engineers, the maritime engineers, have the skill set to be uh, used very flexibly in all sorts of engineering jobs. Um, I mean, some of them become consultants, some of them work offshore on the platforms, some of them do uh, substation design um, and so on and so forth. So, so that's, that, that seemed to have been a targeted um, a development at the, at the Applied Sciences Colleges um, around Denmark. Okay, can I just interfere to see if Kirsten can, can, in, can add something to that as well? <laughs> since we have two minutes to lunch and you want us to be quick yeah, yeah. Exactly. you interpret me correctly yeah <laughs> um how transferable are the skill sets is a really interesting question and if you um look at the work that my phd student will publish in three years in scotland she'll tell you <laughs> um there are a number of um different things that are worth saying just to again open up some questions we often think that people are going to move from platforms to renewable production what about the demand side, um, particularly in terms of retrofit in the UK and, you know, the integration of heat pumps, etc. But also what about the potential that they don't move into the energy sector um, and that we develop new economies and new um, <clears throat> new technological options that aren't <laughs> around this. And I have a, another student that's done that in Louisiana and said, oh, no, they might imagine an oil and gas phase out. They don't imagine a renewable future. It might be something altogether. So there's a whole bunch of normative assumptions that we're putting in place that might not stand true. Mm -hmm. Can I just say quickly, yeah, there is a class issue going on here. Lower skilled workers are more in trouble than engineers. Mm -hmm. And it's a question of e either way you need training. Who's paying for that training? And what kind of guarantees do you have for social welfare, etc. So, so the issue is there. And I think the biggest issue is the uncertainty of whatever this other is. It's to workers, it's it's not concrete. And in the, in Scotland, they complain that the green comes with more precarious work and lower conditions. Thank you. Uh, I just want to finish by uh, acknowledging our project leader, Adriana Chavaria, who's been doing a lot of work <laughs> putting together this session as well. Um, and with that, I just want to thank you all for coming and uh, let's go for lunch.